Hi, guys. Welcome to this episode of The Trainer Feed. We are your hosts. I am Angel Sanchez. We have David Bravo. Here. And Jacques De La Gere. De La Gere. <laughs> What's up, everyone? How we feel today? <laughs> We're in a pretty funny mood. We already kind of kicked up on some high notes before we start this recording. But how's everyone feeling? We good. We good. Just got back from work. Yeah. How about you? How are you doing? You just came back from Florida, right? I came back from Florida Wednesday. I know I picked up Alfie from you Wednesday. Uh, Florida is a different world to up here. It is, yeah, it's just different. And um, on average, how many masks did you see being worn? Correctly? It depended on where you were. Oh. But South Beach, not none. No, but yeah. if you're outside, you're on the beach. I understand. But as soon as you get close to people, but I'll tell you this, some of the servers, I'd say not all, but most of them weren't wearing masks properly. It was like hanging like around their mouth. And then when we were back in Fort Myers the night before I left, the server was like just below his nose. I'm like, it's not that hard. Like to, and I get it. It's going to be a pain to wear it, but we all three of us work in gym and we have to wear it, you know, and, um, it's not that hard, hard, honestly. And, um, it, it was a good trip, though. Uh, if anyone in the Florida area is near Fort Myers, I strongly recommend going to see Alex's show. It's in uh, Fort Myers, uh, Broadway Palm Diner. It's like a dinner theater, so it's very different. Um, and it was awesome, though. Um, I'd never seen On Your Feet on Broadway. So this is my first time seeing it, and it's uh, it's so cool. And the, what's, the, what's On Your Feet? Is that the name of the show? That's the name of the show, and uh, she's going to kill me if she asks me to describe it, and I can't. So I'm going to kind of... So I'm gonna kind of skip that. It's um. Well, don't give it away too. If people yeah, I won't give it, it away. So ch- check it out. Tune in. Um, but the cool thing was I got to hang out with the cast after, and the it, it, the musical theater people are just so fascinating. And I think it's obviously like first mention of COVID. COVID has sucked for many reasons, but one has been taking away that aspect of our lives, and especially in New York City and on Broadway because. They're just, they're just such talented people and when you're around them it's just such an infectious energy that they give off and uh there was one day i'll keep this short but there was one day we're in miami um there's four or five of the cast members are from miami and we went to one of their parents place and we were like eating food and whatever hanging outside then the the, the parents used to be performers as well and the performers are, uh, the parents are like oh let's come inside we're gonna do a show and i thought they were joking no no they did like a show and they're like performing and then the daughter whose parents yeah. it was she did billy jean uh, acoustic and it was phenomenal like it was so good and they just everyone's got these sick voices guess, and they're so talented I guess you're used to it i think because you're with alex all the time but i don't yeah. alex doesn't belt out notes all day every day okay. so that might be why but it's just being seeing that and i'm just i'm like i hope yeah. they don't come to me and ask for me to perform because i will I just it's, yeah i mean i will do like clap my hands and be like that's all i can do you know <laughs> like do a black, ba- um, do a backflip and like mess it up and be like, that's my trick, you know? Like it's just, it's I mean, so fascinating. It's it's hard for me at least. I mean, it's I'm kind of reserved sometimes if I'm around people I don't know very much. So I remember I've been to, I've been to parties and you know of performers and there was one time where I went, I had nothing in common with any of them, and then they're all like, you know, do you remember this composer or did you audition for that? I'm like, I, no. I there is a little bit of that, but. On. I just, I just kind of sat there and, and do what I do best and eat food. <laughs> I just kind of, uh, but it was, I, I just left and I was like, damn, those people they're fun though. Just, I will say, there's so much fun and they're very. I think I don't know if this is an assumption, but because you have to be so switched on and so tuned in, and it's a lot of work and it's so basically and mentally demanding on the body to perform and to do it so often. But I think you have to be wide a certain way to keep yourself so in tune of everything that they're just very different characters and like when we were in the car with some of them and like they were just like joking and rambling and i'm just like oh they're just they're very creative and different people and it, it, it's a good thing that they're like that and it's a good thing to be around those people mm-hmm. um and i can see why alex is having a blast like the weather was good you were really cool exciting people She'll text you call you but like i ain't coming back <laughs> yeah she's like yeah we're moving to florida and i was like no i'm coming not. back this is <laughs> But uh, but yeah, long long sorry, long and short for boring our listeners. That was a that was a good trip. And thanks to Angel for look after Alfie, who um, probably didn't want to come home after he kind of made himself comfortable right on your couch, kind of like made himself at home. 
Yeah, Alfie was good. He was a good dog. He is a good dog. You know, he snores like a grown man. Yeah, and he really loves that. chasing squirrels. I didn't show you this, or I didn't take a video of it. But when we were going down the stairs at Morningside Park, <clears throat> there was a squirrel that, uh, you know, kind of like was in the trees, and Alfie just like, you know, gets focused, and then the squirrel popped up like on one side of the stairs. And I'm just, we're on the top of the stairs. And I'm like, uh, don't do it, like, <laughs> because <laughs> he just wants to bolt. Like you could just don't do it, bloodbath. He it. stops. Yeah, he's like stops. And then the squirrel just like booked it across and then he wanted to like follow the squirrel like down the stairs and off the stairs. And I was like, you can't climb on trees, man. Like, I know. Oh, All but, they'll do is they'll yeah. they'll be at the bottom of the tree and, and, and they'll wonder, they're like, where'd it go? Yeah, look as, right. as if the squirrel time traveled somewhere else. It's kind <laughs> yeah. of funny. Yeah, no, but Alfie's good. Alfie's a very good dog. He's a very sweet dog. So it was a pleasure to watch him. Thanks Let's again, jump into... All of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. So I had some boring topics, but um, one of the things I was going to talk about is a uh, high bar, uh, high bar squat, high bar back squat and fixing forward lean. And I checked out an article that um, went over some stuff that we probably have been through already, but maybe some of our listeners haven't. So some ways to get around that. What do you guys got? David? In terms of your topic or my topic? <laughs> no. Yeah, your topic. Yeah, your topic. Uh, right? I want to chat about creatine. All right, cool. It's one of the most researched uh, supplements in the market. Cool. You've been on a supplement a supplement train for a little yeah. while. Yeah, yeah he's talking about going. the shit that doesn't work. And now we're going to talk about the things that may, that have a good possibility of <laughs> that still don't work. <laughs> things that, you know, may well, work. When are we going to get just uh, straight steroids, man? You know that shit works. <laughs> yeah, definitely that definitely works oh right. exactly. I mean, I talk about what it actually does people think that if you inject yourself with steroids they just grow muscles like nah bro it's not how it works and then uh i found and i have a and i'll go into the reasoning behind why i picked this but i i, I found um a study on acl injuries and some of the biomechanics behind the findings in in these studies um uh because it, it's when you have an, a knee injury, everyone always says, oh, I see I'm still, I'm like, there's more than just those injuries, but they're just some of the more common ones. So that's kind of what I want to go over. There's a statistic out there too, right? When it comes to female injuries and MCL or ACLs, like there's a, like, I don't know, like a crazy dominance towards one injury for female knee injuries. ACL, right? Female. I think so. Oh, I haven't seen that. I think so. It's like 90 something percent of all knee injuries in females. I, I wow. think. I think. Do you think it's because they may be more hyperextended at the knee? It's possible. This, ar this article does talk about um, it does mention the different sexes. Uh, in some sports, it feels more favored the, uh, the kind of injury that leads to ACL tears. But um, damn, where was I going with this? It does talk about knee flexion angles and hip abduction angles and and those being factors in what leads to those kinds of injuries but it's it's super, super fascinating cool all right so i'll i'll start off with the the easy one david will go through with the creatine which we know which we know about and then we'll finish up with uh white jock, powder. jock stuff um the other white powder uh the white powder <laughs> All right, so excessive forward lean. So everybody's been through back squat. I think when I say back squat, everybody knows what we're talking about, but placing a barbell on your back, this high bar and low bar position of said, uh, said exercises. But the high bar position um, has been one of the points of interest for me specifically because my fiance, when she does her high bar back squats, there is a excessive forward lean. And I've been trying to like work on her um, kind of like counteracting that. And we've went through a couple of things to try to fix it, but it hasn't been the easiest um, thing to, to fix. And some of my clients go through the same thing. So when I was doing some research, I saw this article and I thought it was pretty cool because it does speak about some of the stuff that we, you know, talked about in, in gyms, such as, you know, reduced ankle mobility. So some of the reasons being uh, reduced ankle mobility, um, weak extensor, profiles and then poor motor planning. Um, so this article just talks about how those are probably like the three most common reasons why there's that forward lean. 
Um, and the forward lean is like, as opposed to just having the bar, if I'm, I'm going to try to describe it and you guys can kind of like correct me if it doesn't make that much sense, but you have the bar um, on your back. And as you go down into your squat, your torso kind of runs perpendicular to your tibia, as opposed to going parallel to your tibia um, as you descend into the squat. So um, one of the things that happens, I mean, obviously for a couple of reasons, that's not the best way to do it because some people will have some back pain after that because it's it's like you're you're almost having to do a huge like good morning to get out of that position versus, you know, keeping the trunk relatively stable and relatively in the same angle. Um, so one of the reasons behind that this article was speaking to was reduce ankle mobility. I know a lot of people, you know, try to focus on stretching on the, of the calf muscles, um, the soleus, uh, this article spoke that the gastrocnemius is probably not the tissue that needs to be stretched as much or mobilized as much because it, because of how it connects above the tibia. Um, and the crosses the knee joint, right? It crosses the knee joint. So it doesn't necessarily play that much into like, if you're going to be able to go into the squat versus the soleus, the soleus, um, will probably be more responsible for that. Um, so being able to mobilize that area is a really good way to work around it. Another one that they spoke about was weak extensor profile. And they're just talking about the hip extensors. So the glutes. And the article was leading to saying that if the glutes are weak, then your body will compensate for that weakness when you go into hip flexion, right? So the glutes focus on hip extension, right? So eccentrically, they're focusing on the hip flexion. So as you go into the hip flexion, you're, if your extensors are weak, then you're going to compensate by bringing the torso forward in order to keep the joint angle relatively the same at the hip. Does that make sense? Um, and then, uh, you know, so focusing on the glutes and strengthening the glutes can help you kind of sit back into it and not worry too much about like, are your glutes going to be able to push through that force or extend through that force. And then the last one was poor motor planning. And that they said was derived typically from, you know, people just not learning how to squat properly or like poor squat mechanics. And typically that is um, found in people who are starting out squatting. So beginners, not so much in experienced lifters, but if you are in that group, then just having a coach or somebody there to coach you through it. And I know there were some cues that we've used in the past where it's like you have somebody facing a wall and you have them go down into a squat. So it's less about the back squat in and of itself, but it's more about the squat movement pattern and teaching them to keep their torso upright as they drop down to a squat and seeing if they can do it. If they can't do it because of, you know, their heels come up off the ground, that's, you know, you can focus on the ankle mobility aspect of it. Or if you see that they're, you know, sitting back and then they just fall over, you might have to focus on the uh, extensor aspect of it. But, you know, just having those cues there might help you get your client or get your athlete able to squat without that excessive forward lean. One thing I will say before I kind of like let you guys kind of dissect that a little bit or digest it or whatever, um, is the reduced ankle mobility thing was interesting because one of the ways that they did a test was with a rubber band. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Now it kind of seems like it might be a little bit more like you could just take a look at somebody's heel and see if their heel comes up off the ground when they go into the squat. Um, and it will probably be the same, you know, the same result, but they have them with the heel on top of a rubber band and you pull the rubber band behind them and then they go into the squat. And if their heel pops up off the ground, then the rubber band will kind of like, you know, snap back. Right. So you have them place their heel on it and you tell the athlete to keep their heel down to keep the rubber band there. And sometimes that helps. Um, especially when you tell somebody that their heels are off the ground, they said, no, it wasn't, or really it was like, sometimes you get that, not all the time, uh, because I think people have a little bit more body awareness than that, but sometimes you get people who don't know, like that their heels are off the ground or their toes are off the ground or their ankles cave in, like they don't feel that. So having something there that's a tactile cue might help them as well. That's it. So I got David. I like squatting and I do a lot of it. Um, 
And I think from my experience, at least, I think the ankle stuff has been the biggest game changer in my, you know, squat and in a lot of my client squats, because if you look at it, you know, when you go down and your ankles don't move at all, then the bar is going to end up falling back and you're going to end up falling on your ass. So yeah, I think really paying attention to, you know, all the tibia length and then your lower and your back and where the bar is placed because if the bar is high then you're generally going to have it's going to have to be it's going to be a lot harder in my opinion to do a high bar back squat and keep the bar directly over your midfoot Mm -hmm. Um, whereas where if you do a low bar then it does become a little more of a you know hinge in a way because you got to sit back into it and load up a little more but yeah i think if a person wants to do a high bar back squat you'll get a lot more muscle muscle use and the quads and the glutes and it's been shown that you get a, a lot more of a uh, of muscle activation doing full depth, you know, back squats rather than quarter squats or high squats. And kind of touching back, uh, touching on that point and one of the ones you mentioned, Angel, with when you get down to the bottom, of, if you if you mention your fiance when she gets to the bottom of the squat and her chest not collapsing but leaning forward, it's in, an interesting take. Is um, and David mentioned like the tibia length and relation to your torso and things like that especially for any of our listeners like realize that everyone's squat's gonna look a little different no like all three of us if we did like a side by side on a, on a front view our squats will all look a little different and, david, and i know you david wants the back view the posterior view all david the time. Wants <laughs> but and and we and, and, and you and i know you know this and this you're taking this from this this article mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. that's something i think we always have to remember when working with clients that yes maybe you're torso does lean a lot further forward than some people and you mentioned it's more beginners than i think that's part of the scenario right where someone's yeah. worked on their ankle mobility someone's aware of what their squat should look like and there's more than one rhyme or reason uh, or method to start correcting that kind of thing and um i think sometimes um it just takes time and and, and having the the client know or the person know what they're actually trying to get. And we've all done the number of cues, external cues, right? Where set your butt on this. And, and if you can communicate to the person that, Hey, a squat is just you taking a seat, you know, and whenever we've had pushback on, Oh no, I don't want to do squats. It'll hurt many. You squat every day in essence. Right. And you might not go down to that same depth. And um, I don't know where I was going with this. I, I wanted to somewhat finish off on, I do think sometimes we take our, our um i don't know if perception is the word the right word for this but our, our foot stance and position for granted how how you know having the shoes sometimes can distort our sense of pushing the ground away with our feet when we give that cue to clients to make sure that our, we don't get we get limited valgus or any inversion um inversion of our ankles or like the ankles collapsing and uh if we can you know I know David had mentioned a few weeks ago about foam rolling and saying the most effective was if you were to do the exercise right after foam rolling. It was along those lines, correct, David? Yeah. You mentioned a few weeks. And I think there's something to be said if you want to roll um, all the tissues around the joints that are going to be involved to the knees and the hips and then the ankles. So if you want to roll your feet, it's not seen very often, but I'll, I'll admit the few times I've done it or clients have done it, they feel, oh, like I feel more loose. I feel a lot more... Um, in control or in more control of my senses of when I get to the bottom of a squat. But it's, I just think as long as a person's not doing a good morning, like you said, mm-hmm. and I want to say squat university actually posted something about people coming out of the squat, almost like a good morning. And he just mentioned that the, the torque angle puts more pressure on your lumbar spine. Mm-hmm. If you're more, if your if your chest is further forward. Cause and it was like a, a leg press at that point. Right. Yeah. And that's why, I don't know who it was. It was definitely a fitness manager. I want to say when they compared the leg press, or maybe it was Diana, I can't remember the leg press was squatting. When you, if you were to put a leg press vertical and you see what it looks like, you just said it, right? You're pretty much in a hinge and you're just bending your legs a little bit. And Mm -hmm. that's why anyone you speak to, yeah, I can put like 20 plates in the leg press. Of course you can, because it's not this one. It's your core isn't working the way it has to with a back squat or front squat. And your range of motion is different and your starting position. If, and when I use a leg press, I tell you, I always put the, um, the seat as further back as possible. Mm. So I'm less in that kind of hinged over position. 
Um, Wait, so you use the leg press? As an accessory towards the end of my workout? Yeah, not as a primary oh, shit. pattern, yeah. He's actually getting swole. Let's, well, not, let's not, you know... Digress. Um, yeah, digress. no, well, let's, let's not shit on people's exercise selections. You know? Damn, Jack. Again, getting them big, thick legs. <laughs> you do what you gotta do, man. Damn. Like every, There's a reason for it. As long as there is a reason for it, I'm sure that it's fine. Reason to get the thick legs. Hell there's yeah. gonna be... Uh, Hell yeah. Summer 21. There was no summer 2020. We're making it count this year. Wow. Yeah. You got tan lines on your legs? Pause. <laughs> I actually, you want to laugh? I got burnt on the front of my ankles. I don't know how. Can you show our viewers or are you not no. that mobile? Uh, it's kind of gone I'll away. Show that shit. Oh, yeah, let them, let them figure it out. Start peeling and shit. Let's see. As you can see. We need some more YouTube viewers anyway, so. Wow. Can you see that's red? Yeah, I can actually see that. I don't know <laughs> how. I, don't, how I, I was that night. I was, was getting back and I was like, how the fuck did i burn that just throwing your feet in the hot sand <laughs> i just like cover my whole town like feet sticking out <laughs> yeah uh but that's it yeah so um also going back to the article there was just a couple of things um there where uh when i was reading it i was like oh this is interesting because it's not only about just mobilizing certain areas of the body for example like trying to mobilize the ankle joint um, but they made mention to the touch squat and the box squat. So touch squat, just like tapping, you know, something and then coming back up and the box squat actually full on sitting and then coming back up, um, as regressions to the back squat, the high bar back squat, and then being able to correct that movement after. And it made me think about Schaefer's point where we were talking about, or I asked him about how to, how do you implement mobility training into your training programs and he said that he's gone away with like doing correctives and he's mm. been using the movement in order to help facilitate the function of the movement later on right so um i think that was a prime example of that but like now that we're speaking to so many people and now that we have kind of like a library of people with um different subjects that they've all touched on it's interesting to kind of read these articles and almost see the coaches behind that sort of mindset or behind the you know, the programming implications or whatever. Anyway, that's what I, I also got. want to quickly jump in. Yeah. What do we, you mentioned box squats. What yeah. I think box squats are good or, or, or you can reason unless you're doing the one where you rock back and come out like that surely feels as though so, it's a bit of momentum. Right. And like you're switching your core off as you sit down and then you can, you know, well, I use that. I actually do use that for um, some of my clients who have had injuries in the past or some of the elderly population uh, geriatric group. Um, my bad. So I use that for the geriatric population and sometimes for people who've had injuries in the past um, mm -hmm. in, re in teaching them to relearn the squat movement pattern because what I want them to do is I want them to use no momentum right um but sometimes they don't have the strength to just get up from that position it's like when you do that they look at you as if you're jesus reincarnated right they're like how do you do Walking that on water about the exactly same thing. exactly so uh i like to use that in order to help them understand the movement pattern that we're trying to do or i use the trx or something but if i don't have anything nothing that they can hold on to that's stable um, then I'll just have them rock forward and backward. And then I'll, I used to, now I can't do this anymore, but we got to figure it out as we continue to, you know, get through this COVID situation. But I used to have the tactile cue. I used to tell them to stack their shoulders on top of their midfoot or their heel. And then from that position, stand up. And sometimes when they used to rock backward and forward, I would say, stop here, touch my hand. Like my hand was right above their midfoot, like, but at shoulder height. And so they would touch my hand with their shoulder. And then from there, I said, now come up. And then they would try to move from there because it would be difficult. Or as soon as you load somebody, sometimes they go into that rocking pattern where they're just like, you know, I could do like 80 pounds. And it's like, it's well, like when if people you're... do pause squats and they sit down and then relax. Yeah, that's... exactly. Right it's, that's, like, yeah, it's like, but that's... that's not what you're doing. You're using momentum, which is great. But now your force is going back up. Exactly. And now your force is not just driving up, you know, your force is driving forward and now your heels are coming up off the ground or there's some other thing that's some other dysfunction that's happening there. That's kind of, that's somewhat where I was going with that. And I think that, as you said, the geriatric population is a good 
way to implement it in their program and, and, and you communicate it to more as it, Hey, I just want to make sure that when you go from sitting down to stand back up, it's an efficient movement. It's not a struggle. So I think you have a valid point and I, I definitely agree and have done the same thing with the geriatric population. That was just my thought, as you mentioned, David, just now with like momentum and your core switches off and it's just, I'm not trying to shut on a movement. I just don't, or pause squats. I think a pause, I would define a pause squat as you're at the bottom, you hold it for a set time, set amount of seconds, come up. That to me would be a pause squat, but I, I don't want to. It's like, when you use momentum, aren't you cheating? Like in, in, in the essence of what the exercise Do you is? really own that weight? You know, right? it's like, so I don't know. Can you, can you see benefits from it? I'm sure. Yeah. Le I, so I don't want to. Leave my geriatric clients alone. No, 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 no. I'm just talking nah, about like someone who is putting you. on four <laughs> plates and they can only do four plates if they do the rocking. And and, and the chances are it might not even be a great depth. And they're not doing a pause. Are they rocking? If they rock, they're going to fuck themselves up. But we, I know we can go on forever, but I won't let David yeah. talk his topic. Sorry. Yeah. Cool but that, Angel, that was a great. I, I do love, we all love like talking about squats, right? Like that's part of being a trainer, but definitely. He talks about that squat life. Hell yeah. What do you think I did yesterday in my first workout? Squats, baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh... David, creatine. What's up with creatine? Well, that we, all about the powder. Come on. Right? we all love supplements because they're like 100% effective, right? No, but um, so last, last, last time we spoke about like the ineffectiveness of weight loss supplements. Um, but creatine isn't necessarily a weight loss supplement. It's it's one of the most researched supplements in the market ever. Um, and I've used it in the past. I don't, maybe you guys, I don't know if y'all have used it in the past. Um, it's basically just a supplement to help you increase the stores of creatine in your body to make more ATP as you're working out. Um, so as we know, as we, you know, use energy and use our, our body, we reduce ATP into ADP. And then we get another phosphate to create ATP again to help you contract your muscles. That's basically what creatine is going to do if you have a certain amount of creatine in your body. And we generally produce it also. We also get it from our diet, from like uh, off the top of my head, meat, like uh, red beef, uh, red meat and stuff like that, which, you know, a lot of it isn't always the greatest thing either. But there's been uh, many research studies that have shown that creatine supplementation in young athletes or just in general, have increased performance in terms of uh, performance in short bursts of energy. So sprints, you know, one rep max, three rep max, um, those types of power movements have been shown to increase performance. And it's generally one of the more, you know, one of the healthier options, unless you have any recurring issues that you have already going on in your like, kidneys or liver stuff. So generally people with diabetes and, and or other liver diseases can't generally shouldn't be taking it but creatine is one of the things that you see everybody at the gym sort of always want to take and it's been shown to you know pretty you know much pretty much have a generally a positive effect in your performance uh, a lot of weightlifters use it i've used it in the past and i've seen some progress i haven't used it recently but one downside to it that I hear from a lot of other people is the whole thing about loading, loading it. Usually people would load it and like take 20 grams of it for like the first week every day. Yo, that's, um, that's, um, that's what they said. That's what they said in the instructions though. That's what they say in the instructions. You're like, Oh, before loading phase, uh, you know, you have to take 20 grams of this a day. And that loading phase is like 10 weeks. Tough. No. <laughs> Tough. 10 weeks. <laughs> Ten weeks. No, I need another is, one after the loading phase. I need another box. I mean, a couple of the studies also, you know, they show that, okay, if you overload yeah. on the creatine, you'll have a huge creatine pool in your body. But also, there have been other studies that use just four grams, I think, a day or four or five grams a day and has an equal um, effect on, on your body. Yeah. Um, I had a client of mine who asked me about creatine and I said, well, I can't tell you what to take, but <laughs> if you needed to, or if you wanted to, then I wouldn't have an issue if you were to take creatine. But the guy was also like, well, you know, I have this new Here's my guy. <laughs> creatine micro, like micro ionized creatine. Oh yeah, they got, they got crazy with it. 
have so many, but, but I that's the other thing too because regular creatine. Yeah, and I think that's monohydrate, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's in, relatively inexpensive. You know, you take five grams a day. Pop. They have them capsules. You just pop it a couple times, and then you'll be fine. I used to I used to take creatine when I was um, in college because I was like, you know, word on the street. It was like word on the street. You got word that the creatine. Street, you know, I got that creatine. You know, you got that protein powder, whatever, whatever. Um, and creatine helped me make massive strength gains. Like, believe it or not, like I was benching like 315. And I was God. weighing like 165. 120. Wow. <laughs> yeah, 120 wet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was like insane. It was That's insane. It's, but it's- It'll and that, help your type. Two. What what are the fast twitch muscle fibers? Type two, right? Yeah, type yeah. two. Um, but it'll help with like those power movements, so like doing a one rep max or like three rep max or whatever it is, and then sprinting. Um, creatine's no joke, but it's it's interesting because, like you said, with starting to have like four grams here or something like that, versus like these loading phases, like the instructions on some of these supplements will tell you to take a lot more than you actually need. Um, and I don't know why. Well, I know why, because then you burn through it and then you buy yeah, more. You buy That's more. pretty much yeah, it. I think I read somewhere. It's a financial um, incentive. Of course. See, they make you take it and you'd be, you know, oh shit, I'm, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> I gotta and, buy more. Yeah. And then, and then they started um, putting creatine in other supplements as well. I think in some pre-workouts they and things like that. C4 has a lot of, has creatine in it. C4 has, has a good amount. But then the thing is, this, this is the thing that the, that the supplement industry does, right? They make proprietary blends that don't have to tell you how much of each thing right. is in it. So if some, if some pre-workout says uh, it's creatine, and then, of course, it'll be like, oh, it'll help you increase gains and then strength, great. But the actual serving of your pre-workout may only have a gram or 0.5 of a gram of, of, of creatine. So you're like, am I actually, like, having any of it? Like, it, it just... They always manipulate so confusing. that stuff to make it. Yeah. Like I'll never forget. Uh, someone told me Larry's cookies is a big like fix of mine. And I have them actually every day and have done for months. Well, Larry's got creatine in it? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I should read the label or shouldn't I? But I never forget. Uh, <laughs> someone told me that's, that's assuring the trainer, right? Uh, they, they, they advertise it being so many grams of protein, mm. but that's for two servings or something or oh only this many mm. calories but that's only for half a serving or one serving is half the cookie it's something yeah. like oh i think it's two i think half the cookie is one serving yeah right yeah and then it's like two servings is the full cookie but who yeah eats half a cookie? but who goes oh let me just have my half so like i've yeah. seen people yep so it's the same with like what you're mentioning david with the uh, uh, the crazy intake if it's oh this many grams of whatever whatever it is people they they like to things are manipulated that they're not lying but it's kind of not completely yeah. accurate or it's a little dicey yeah. and also so. you, they you know the the you know supplement companies have come out with all these other types of creatine right and mm-hmm. they have been as researched as creatine monohydrate um so so far the creatine monohydrate has been the one of the ones that have been shown to have a generally you know, have an impact on your performance increase muscle mass you know uh, lean mass as well because of course if we get stronger we lift heavier weights your body needs to produce more muscle to handle those weights so you're gonna start right. having more of it and know? also it's something that maybe this was my misconception when i first about creatine as you mentioned david it's to help you replenish your atp levels yep. right and but the common misconception is oh this is gonna get me big People do that, and I think the, that happened because of the loading phase. Yeah, I think David's right on that. Yeah, right on the be, money. Because of the loading phase, like, hey, take 20 grams of this creatine. And I haven't I haven't read up on whether or not it does actually cause the bloating, but I think it... it I got puffy. People feel puffed. I got puffy. Right, you know, know, maybe just increase the water intake. I, I don't know, but... Yeah, I think when I took it, I only did five grams, and I felt fine. Yep. You know? My brother has this that common misconception too. It's like, oh, you know, I have to. I don't want to take much of it because I don't want to. Get, I'm like, nah, dude, you'll be fine. Yeah, just yeah. don't do that loading phase. Don't buy into that. Don't do the loading phase. There's no point. Just take five grams a day. You'll be fine. But be consistent. You yeah. Take yes. it on a Monday and then forget about it and then take rest of the week. Back, yeah. You know, but um, yeah, and one of the other things there wasn't much 
effect on long-term long you know endurance type exercises right you know because as we as we know especially in the three different types of energy systems anything over what is it anything over a minute and a half i think yeah Yeah. comes the uh i forgot which which one is like the second to third muscle system so at that point you you aren't using energy system you use it of course fast glycolytic use it of course exactly like you use the atp in the beginning the first about 30 seconds and then you start getting into your fat stores and everything like that so that's why short burst one rep max three rep max maybe even five rep max if you do it fast <laughs> no nah, you're gonna have people throwing the damn barbells around Stop five it. rep max we're doing like, fast one rep max for five you only got eight five, seconds you only got... <laughs> that's a leg press than, you're stronger than, than what you believe you could do that you know? on a leg no, press, yeah, leg press. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah now forget yeah, those guys you know, that loaded up the leg press for like no range you're like really you can take you're gonna take 25 of the four pound 45 pound plates just to do that no nah, worse than that is the guys field, that have that on, leg extension or was it hyper extension at the knee and then they're locking out that shit oh, cringe have you seen that's that video worse. when it goes wrong it's a, mm, that's why i don't put that many plates on that's it, my it reason. sounds like this mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> spot on <laughs> Oh shit! Jacques, Jacques's like, no, not my nah, mind the history. I'm like, there is no way. But um, yeah, you know, it's it's. I think one of the safer supplements out there. If you don't have any other underlying conditions, if you ever want to take it, I would definitely recommend you talk to your doctor. Let them know that you're taking it. Yeah, it won't hurt to do that, right? It'd be a yeah. Move. You know, we're, we don't we are not promoting, you know, for our listeners to take supplementation. But if you do. Please talk to your healthcare provider. Enter Bravo twenty for twenty percent off. <laughs> <laughs> Called DB. DB Bravo out. twenty. Hashtag swipe up. Twenty <laughs> percent promo code. Uh, All right, Jacques. What what did you have today? So uh, I wanted to cover a study talking on a uh, ACL tear, so anterior mm-hmm. cruciate ligament. This is one of the four ligaments that stabilize the knee joint, and one reason being. I mean, it's a very common knee injury in sports, but uh, some of you guys who may know, I'm a huge hockey fan, and the New York Islanders captain, this guy, Anders Lee, he Ooh. went out. <laughs> he, he tore his ACL, I want to say, like, two weeks ago now. But Oh, shit. It, or maybe it's like a 10... Was it last week? I think it was a week ago, but whatever it was, when I saw it, I thought, uh, I think he's done for the season. It's kind of... And it was a not a complete contact hit. He got hit and the way he fell was kind of awkward. So it wasn't a completely direct hit. Uh, so it was an indirect collision. And um, he didn't come out the rest of the game. And I was texting my friend during it. And I said, there was no update till the day after or whatever. But I said, if he was done for the season, they would have said. They would have said the MRI. And it came out like two days ago. Like, oh, he's done for the season. I was like, oh, shit. So I, I was just kind of guessing with him. I thought, like, is it is it something serious? And it came out as an ACL. So I think let me do some more research on it because majority of ACL injuries are non-contact. And so I found this study by a Swedish research group, and they did a shout out. Yeah, shout out. They did a Swedes. they did studies with uh, UEFA, Swedish and Norwegian Football Association. So just to clarify, football is in for American followers, soccer. The we say ball it again? on the ground. Why do you say it like that. Soccer. Soccer. How do you guys say? It? No, Soccer. it's a. I've noticed that Jacques' accent. It's uh, like his R's are heavy. Like when you say, because he's British. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But your your accent's unique though, right? Because it's not necessarily just coming from everyone. Everyone. Everyone's like, oh, what part of Australia are you from? I'm like, uh... wait, is it your mom? Uh, your mom and your dad? Like they're. One Scottish, one's French, right? That's right. My dad's yeah, my dad's French. That's why the the full name is is French. Your mom is Scottish. Wait, you know, wait. I thought you grew up in the UK. I mean, I know Scotland is in the UK, right? But yeah, where are you Scotland's, from? You fifty cent. Where are you from? You, Scotland's part of the UK. Yeah. Well, it is for now. Wait, anyway. where did you predominantly grow up? England. Oh. So they just wanted to fuck y'all accents up. Shit, dude. Yeah, <laughs> you and your brothers. Like They're just yeah. like, you know what? I'm going to talk this way. She's going to talk live that here, way. Go there. We're going to live here. Well, fun, actually, small caveat. We went to uh, Scotland when we used to visit my grandparents one year. And, uh, in the castle? I wish. Actually, my, my father's side of the family had a castle. I must have lost it because it's still named that castle, but it's not our name anymore. Yeah. 
So, oh, um, shit, we got royalty. You, in wait, you lost feet. it. You got to go get the. the so my, my back. mom's theory was, how does a castle still have your family name, but it's no longer belongs to anyone in the family? And she's like, you must have lost it gambling or something. So that was like her theory. That's your new project, Jacques. Find that deed. Find that deed. And we out. Find it's that. not Trainer a big. Feed goes live, goes international. When I say castle, it's not that big. Like we went, well, our castle, we were there. It's like, it's kind of like a big manor, really. So, oh, it's, manor. Man, it's bigger than my apartment. Shit, it's bigger than my It's bigger apartment. than all our apartments, but still. Whoa, whoa, but, uh, wait, right. <laughs> whoa. No, I mean, look, it doesn't belong to any of us. Chemistry and has a manor. No, come oh, on. Shit. Doesn't belong to anyone in the family, right? Lost it. So, <laughs> but long and short, we went it. to. We've already taken it. Yeah, we're coming back. <laughs> uh, we went to Scotland one year. Uh, well, we went. We would go every year, but we went and uh, we went to the service station. And this guy had a very thick accent. My mom being the Scottish one, she was like, she was like "Let me handle this." And she went up to order, and she, the guy's accent was so thick. She turned around, and started laughing at me. And she's like, "I don't understand what he's saying." <laughs> and she's and then we we laugh like we thought it was hilarious because it was just such a such a thick accent. Was it like Braveheart? I was like, what do you want? You're called a call and you're and, and he's asking what drink you want on the food. But oh you want Dai Cola, you want Fala, you want that? Like, it was very thick and it's wow, kind of it's yeah, it's hard. So when people say, oh, I, I like the I like the people which don't understand the accent. So it's it, and there's there's a whole other dialogue, like like with English uh with English speaking people in the UK as well. There's just a very different dialogue to the US and stuff. But um where was I going with this? The ACL injury. Yeah, you, you <laughs> yeah, said soccer. Sorry. And that was my bad. I'm sorry. Soccer. So, so this this study had a this study really tried to look at identifying patterns and what it what it figured that if you have th- the three main scenarios where the ACL injuries were happening were non-contact, so no one is anywhere near you, and it, it, the tear happens. Um, uh, what was the second one? Um, you said indirect contact indirect sorry that was the second one sorry indirect so indirect when someone's got contact with you but not in the area of the knee where mm-hmm. you receive where you get the acl tear mm-hmm. and then complete contact so the three areas of the most common one so of the 39 acl injuries they looked at 20 of them were non-contact no one was near you mm-hmm. and it was predominantly when a player was if they headed the ball, it's clear. And it, oh, it's also in a defensive stance. So if you were defending, you're playing in defense or de- as a defender of some sort, where you're clearing the ball, where you were closing someone down, and you would place pretty much your whole load on one leg. Mm-hmm. And it looked at the angles of that leg. So it looked at saying that there was commonly knee valgus mm-hmm. along with knee flexion not being greater than 20%. Mm-hmm. And then uh, hip abduction as well. So this study just showed that all these ACL injuries had those factors: hip abducted, a little bit of knee valgus, knee flexion, and the it, it has a couple of case studies and the and uh, examples they showed. But I thought it was quite fascinating that it wasn't. Oh, and then ankle inversion inversion had no when I say no bearing, it wasn't one or the other that was typically constant with that injury it could be mm. one or the other it was like 50 50 mm-hmm. but so it, it really spoke about someone placing the majority of the load when they were coming down from a jump or when they're trying to push off one leg and it was abducted uh dominantly predominantly with knee valgus and very minor knee flexion uh so they spoke about ways to try and avoid it are training with uh, working on balance, changing of direction, and something they also mentioned in the studies with, or the images of the players that had got the ACL tears were, if their if their leg was one way, their torso turned the other way. So I don't want to go into too much detail because I don't, I, I want to say I understand it enough, but maybe not so much to explain it. But I think they were trying to suggest that when you're when so many forces are placed in your body and your core is in the other direction to where your stabilizing leg is on the floor with the contact it's maybe a common factor in those injuries. So that was just something I thought was interesting. I know I, I should have looked at maybe like in hockey or other sports, but in terms of, I'd say sports played on a turf or grass. And this was in this particular example was football. Those were the, the findings. Cutting? So cutting. Yeah. So when you're, but, but most of these, no one was attacking. It was mostly when you were defending. So I thought it was quite interesting. Right. So maybe, yeah. I mean, if you think of it, let's say, 
you're going up against Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo, and they just start cutting out of nowhere. You got to cut with them, right? Yeah. It's like, but remember when we took the certified strength coach thing? Remember that? Yeah. With, um, that guy that yelled at me for doing CrossFit. <laughs> it's not CrossFit. All right, just get in more than one rep. All right, calm down. <laughs> he was like, "All right, guys, do three. Jacques like doing twenty, and he's like, "This ain't I did, CrossFit." I did like five. Come on, <laughs> this ain't CrossFit. But so he, when he, when we were going through the ladder drills, like, and I didn't know this when we were going through lad, ladder drills, I would cut. I think with my with the with the wrong leg, and he was like, "All right, when you're going, let's say you're trying to cut to the left, all your weight should be on the right leg, right?" Mm-hmm. And I think I don't know what the fuck I was doing. I think I was putting the weight on my left leg. You were getting an ACL at this forward. point. Yeah. I was like, oh shit. And that's when I, my knee was fucked up too. I don't know if you guys remember. There you go. The next day, over. Because we were doing broad jumps. And it was just horrible. But yeah, I know it's ACLs, you know, knock on wood. You know, I've, I've been fortunate not to have any issues, but you know. And some, oh, sorry, I'll let Angel chime in. Just one last thing I forgot to mention is that some of these ACL injuries require surgery. Some of them don't. I remember a couple of. Uh, hockey players I've when I followed the, the NHL one guy didn't need surgery he took a long time for it to heal but so it just uh, and also whenever someone sees me with my injury they're like oh ACL MCL I'm like nope and I try to explain to them what it is I was like oh it's, it's not an ACL I'm like yeah no don't don't forget about the ligaments it's all uh, it's all bone related college but oh, sorry Angel go on chime in no I was gonna uh I was thinking about what you said in relationship to like about the ACL in relationship to like the ankle, like what was going on there, because I was mm-hmm. wondering if it would, it might have anything to do with the fact that you guys are wearing like cleats and it's um, like a soccer field or a football field or whatever you call it. I don't the pitch know. pitch. I'd say yeah. the pitch. All right. So y'all are in the pitch, wearing them cleats. <laughs> <On> the <pitch. laughs> they actually well, call them boots as well. What? Right. Yeah. That's weird. All yeah, right, so you're boots. doing the soccer shit, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> wearing these boots, wearing these pitch. boots in the pitch. Um, but yeah, I was wondering about that. But it seems like you know, it, it can happen any. It can happen on the ice. I guess that's what you call it in hockey, right? The ice. Yeah, I'll have to maybe while in our story, we'll 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 tie in the the video. But it was he kind of fell awkwardly, and his leg got kind of hold it in a weird way so yeah. i'd love to do more research on our sports but sorry yeah and basketball as well like it's basketball not too. Wait, gymnastics yo, Angel, when are you getting some school. soccer boots soccer. Jacques and i we out i'll bring the ball we out yeah we've got ours you just gotta get yours shit i mean i'll give trainer it a shot feed, trainer feed goes soccer trainer feed live youtube trainer feed live oh and it's uh women are twice to two t- uh, oh, i'm sorry twice to two times Twice to ten times as likely to tear uh, ACL than men, and they say they don't know what the real reasoning is. It might be differences in anatomy or muscle strength or hormonal so influences. Weird. Yeah, I don't know, but that was the stat I was looking for. It. Um, but yeah, I think playing on turf probably is not condu- is is probably another risk factor too, right? Like just being on the grass with the boots and all that stuff. But I don't know. I know the the, the San Francisco 49ers were mm. complaining when they played the Jets in week two of last season because mm. I think they had three or four guys that one game grow out of ACL tears mm-hmm. excuse me, or, or, or lower body injuries. I think it's a tough. In the in, As far as I'm aware, in Europe, in terms of Champions League or European um clubs and locations facilities my understanding is it's all real grass um right and i think if there's an exception it might be tottenham because it's a newer stadium but my my understanding is all real grass Mm. and it's not to say i don't ever see those injuries but i feel as though i see it more commonly in the nfl because i mean the nfl the other thing as well is i don't know what this is just a thought but i don't know how this plays out but if you're a player and i know you're an athlete you're a freak of a machine but every week you play on almost a different surface or it's not consistently the same one every week. I don't know how that has bearing on, you know, I think I, so for example, Saquon Barkley last year, he went out with a is it ACL, MCL, one of the two, and it was a contact hit and it didn't look, most of these injuries don't look that hard. Mm-hmm. Right. And most of them, who is it? I think Terry, Teddy Bridgewater as well. in the NFL, 
non-contact, just the way he fell or, or like just the way it buckled. And I don't know. It's, it's so interesting because these guys train their whole life and are, are real specimens and love serious weight, but it's, it's at the end of the day, your, your tissues and your fibers are not, even though, I mean, yeah, your muscle fibers are maybe a bit bigger if you're a bigger person, but at the end of the day, your tendons and ligaments are pretty much going to stay the same size, right? Depending on how, for the most part, like it's not as if when you put on 20, 30 pounds of muscle, your ligaments and tendons grew inflated that much either, you know? So there's always, I always think of that too, you know, but um, I'd be interested right. to see what, if we found a, a study on, based on the surface because again this being uefa and this being the swedish and norwegian football associations it's all predominantly played on grass i'm pretty positive mm. so um and, and even uh even basketball when i hear the squeaking on the court my thinking is like oh man i just that's the what that i think my doctor was said two things i shouldn't do were running and not ever play basketball, play but basketball. don't don't start playing. I remember we played outside years ago. That was like the scared I the most scared I've been for my knee because I didn't want to turn a corner. But I think I think Dude, this, you were you were on three point line, just you know. I was one. I don't really understand how to play that well, so that's probably part of it. Ball in the hoop. and defense is like bullshit. I can't touch nobody. I'm like checking these people. Like, what do you mean I can't check these people? Can't check people. <laughs> Just saying rugby. No, but then uh, I can't remember who it was. Greg's like, hey, yo, oh. hey, yo. three point yeah. buckets. That was the first one. I, that was the first time I've ever seen Greg upset yeah. during that basketball game. I, I think I was on. He said, but he you was were on Edu's team. I was on Greg's team. No, that was the same team. Me, you, Edu, oh, and it Greg. was. It was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was Greg, Edu, you, and you and me. Oh, oh, Greg, you. oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, Adu is nasty as well, right? He's it's pretty good. Nasty yeah, good. But um, the the I can't remember who someone tried to explain it as tearing ACL. I don't know if it was a fitness manager as well in the early days. That um, if we think about mobile, stable, and uh, sorry, mobile, stable, mobile joints, so on up the chain, and um, this happens. I see this in cable turns when people like mm. go through their knee and it, it make it like, it kind of skews me out because you, I can't get a hammer who told me this, but some of those injuries happen when you make the knee move as a mobile joint and not a stable joint. And if you pivot and your ankle joint and hip joint stay somewhat as a stable joint or act as a stable joint and the mobile joint role is led to the knee, that's when you get some of the tears also. And I think that's why it's important when you do those, uh, you're basically shops. making the knee go like this. Yeah, exactly. And doing this as opposed to mo keeping the knee joint. As yeah, exactly. That's a great uh, illustration, David. Thank you. Because I was trying to think of a way of explaining it. And that's why when you do those rotations, pivot in your feet. Check the YouTube. No, check the YouTube. Check, for yeah, check the illustration. YouTube. Um, but that's all. I just I see those and I'm like, and when we see some pretty reputable coaches doing it, at least I have, and I'm thinking, huh, that's a very interesting. Uh, it's not to say it's wrong. I just think you're doing you're just protecting your knee better if you're going to pivot in your feet and make sure the mobile joints keep those roles of being mobile and the stable joints such as the knee stay the stay have their roles of being stable remember the video i sent y'all about that guy mobilizing the spine can't remember yes i do remember david's you know being I silly on the uh, on the group chat on ig today yesterday stabilizing it, it wasn't that. it wasn't like that the dude was just met doing exercise with bad form <laughs> they was just <laughs> mobilizing his spine anyway oh man Before... Dave's savage forever yeah um i wanted to say something really quickly but i completely forgot what oh oh one of the things that i wanted to talk about was um just to throw it in there to see if we before we run out of time do we um I was working with a couple of clients and trying to identify reasons and ways um, that they're ready, willing, and able to achieve like their goals. And I know we spoke to Dan about that briefly in one of the podcasts. And I was just like thinking in my head, like how many different versions of ready, willing, and able do we see? Right. And then like, what are some of the success stories? So do you guys have any like success stories or client success stories where you're just like, this person went from 
point A to point B and then to point C to point D, like they were just like hitting all the green lights. Um, and what were some of the things that you noticed from them, whether it was like the language they use or like uh, actions they did, for example, like showing up to their workouts on time or just like doing their homework? Like what were some of the things that you guys noticed when you noticed that uh, your clients were ready, willing and able? Hey, um, go first. I think the biggest thing that I've seen is people or at least client, a client of mine be sort of looking forward to going heavier or looking forward to making something a little more complex rather than being like, oh, I want to do this. That and also just making it a habit to if when they come into the gym, there's a spot that sells relatively healthy food and they usually don't have it. Like I made a client of mine every morning before we, we would work out, she would go in and have like, so like a healthy omelet have her greens and stuff and you know maybe give her give herself a couple of minutes because she would she was able to like work uh remotely mm. give herself some minutes and come to the gym you know already fueled up or or after the gym so she would always go and have her meal and that's something coming from a point of not having enough to eat ever like she's not not just mm -hmm. not eating because she's like i don't have time i'm like no 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 before you see us or after go make sure to go to that spot get yourself your your your, your food and then we'll be good and ultimately, it just led to her, you know, getting stronger and, you know, losing body fat. Um, I have one also. I'm trying to think more of a recent one because um, I've had more struggles than anything. And it's just taking the time with the process of it to set it. And as you said, ready, willing, and able. They'll say they're ready and it's not quite it's not quite the case. And But an example where I know we've all spoken about this, but I think one of the first successes I have is with increasing the daily step count because it's, Easy measurable, but a, an example of a success story when we spoke about doing a certain amount of steps a day and they would just text me the screenshot. And um, that's, that's not 100% of the, of the stories, but it's I think that's where this person is is buying in. This person knows you want to get back to where they were a couple of years ago. They understand that they're, they're at, at an area of opportunity, and um, but consistent. And that's where... Just buying in and and uh, understanding it's a process. Understanding that they'll because like, I've had scenarios when someone said, um, "Oh, you're gonna hate me for this," but I, I had cheat food on this. I was like, I'm not gonna hate you. I want you to enjoy your life. When you say hit you or hate you, hate, hate, hate. I must clarify that. So like being his client. No, 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 no. But I don't. I don't. We don't want them to think. Oh shit, Angel David. Angel David. They're gonna kill me because I had a, a bubble tea or I had a. No, there's, we want you to enjoy life, but we're not going to be happy if you've crushed a box of cookies every night for the past two weeks and you've not told us about it. Or you, know? or well, you expect I, there to be change even if you still do that. Yeah, I'm not going to be like, all the onus on the trainer unhappy. when I'm going to be like, yeah, all right. So well, talk you want to dig deeper. Why? You want to be like, tell me more about that. Yeah, and what's, I'm not going to be unhappy. Yeah, tell me I'm what's be like disappointed or anything like that. Because that's almost I'm the disappointed. same. disappointed. <laughs> Yeah, because that's almost the same thing, sometimes even worse, right? Than right. hating them. But I think, excuse me, going to what you're saying, it's not. Uh, I don't I feel, know. yeah, I don't feel any type of way about what they do. Like when they do it and they say they do it and it is what it is, like I don't feel any type of way because I think that there's a reason behind that. And I think the reason is probably a bigger Biggest. piece yeah. than, you know, what they actually did, right? Like whether it was like eat tubs of ice cream or like not go to sleep until like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. Like the reason behind it is much bigger than the actual action itself. And, you know, I mean, I think for my little bubble of experiences, maybe there are some experiences that are um, crazier or much more wild than I can even imagine. But yeah, I mean, we've we've all had scenarios where it. I don't know if it was, maybe it was with Andrews last week where we spoke about finding out the why behind why someone wants to do something, or when you suggest how to eat or habits. They're not. It, it's not that the person is trying to purposely sabotage what we're telling them. It's just that yeah. it's not. They're not at that stage or. As I mentioned, when I was in the, the developmental 
Developmental mentorship? Yeah. When something that clicked in my head was you're going to have a better success rate if the person, the client comes up with their own suggestions for improvement or as opportunity, as opposed to us labeling and listening it to them saying, mm. I mean, we all know what it takes to lose body fat percentage or gain muscle mass, or just get a rhythm of doing a, a frequent amount of resistance training. We all know what it is, what it takes, but how each person responds to what they need to do to change is all very different, very specific. So I think that's the other thing. And, and like you said, this, this, when you speak to some clients, this alcohol is not going away in their life. Like it's part of their routine. It's part of like the client dinners or whatever. And uh, there's just, uh, so you work on the other low hang, lowest, other lowest, blah, other lowest hanging fruit. Right. So you work on other things and, and, um, but um, there's definitely, it's definitely not easy, but th- did you have a specific example or you want to, No, I was going to say that some of the experiences that I've had have been similar to David's in the sense that the person is excited about working out or excited about the program. Um, And I, I did want to make mention to this because I've noticed that sometimes coaches just overlook that and they overlook these um, opportunities that the client is ready, willing, and able to make um, sustainable change and they just kind of like graze over things right because there's a lot of times because we we are exhausted with you know people saying what do I need to eat or what do I need to do and give me homework and then people just not doing it right so because of that I feel like a lot of coaches can just graze over these opportunities and not really see them as such because they're just you know this is just another person asking me to do something for them and I'll do it and then they just won't follow up However, I have noticed that in my training experience, when the client is excited about, you know, going up in weight or trying a new progression to an exercise, or they're excited about like the new block or the new phase in their training program, these are little notes that let you know that this person is actually engaged and they want to not only just continue to train because some people will just train for years and it'll just be part of their routine. It's not necessarily something that they do for change. It's just something that they do to put, um, to just check a box. Um, For example, like they call cabs and they have like a cab driver, right? Like they have a cab driver. Some people have personal trainers. It's just like one of those things. Like you're just the guy for the gym and that's it. But um, what I've noticed is, yeah, when they're excited about the program, when they're excited about like these um, program shifts or progressions, regressions, things like lateralizations, things like that, Um, it becomes an opportunity for me to just touch base with them, check in, see what, see if they still feel like they're in line with their goals. And then if not, how do we get them to that point? Um, And then also just making sure that they're um, like keeping that excitement, like keeping that engagement, right? Because sometimes people will just not even Uh, say anything to that and that's kind of like a lost opportunity like the person is really excited about their back squats and then all of a sudden you know they're you're not doing back squats anymore you're doing like something else and they don't see the connection if it's okay if it if there's a reason behind it but making sure to draw those connections um, keep them engaged and hopefully elicit some sustainable change that's it i just wanted to give some notes i like it i like that i think it's also important that when when they're bought in the program and they're excited about it, I, I always love reinforcing exactly what you just said. If it's the back squats you're like doing and having some sort of linear relationship with, okay, you've you've mastered the back squat. And I always I always love to communicate that we probably all do this, but once you've mastered something, there's a progression. There's whether it's with the barbell, whether it's with a kettlebell, what's a different tool, whether it's a different stance in the squat there's always something you're going to progress to and then uh, work your way back to some of those patterns you did previously own. As you mentioned, if it was from back squat to front squat to sort of split squat, and then you come back the other way around, and then maybe you change your rep types. And I think that there, as long as there's another, um, I don't know. I also like to remember to mention to people that there's not a one size fits all. And I, I am somewhat avid or f- uh, frequently on Pinterest for different reasons, different pictures. And I see all these do this workout and I just think like, oh man, this is such bad. It's bad that they'll tell you do these four exercises for three days a week, 
for a month and you'll be ripped. And it's like, oh, there's so much more to it than that. And I think as long as a person knows that just because that workout was on there, you should see some change. One, because you're just exercising frequently, but it's not, everybody's going to respond differently. And I think, um, but I just think it's full transparency, right? And I think even when there's an opportunity for you to say, hey, we should be able to hit this weight or we should see strength gains in this way. There's possibilities you don't, but being transparent that, you know, and, but I think we've probably mentioned this in previous episodes where not caring less, but if you put all your time and effort into the program, into making sure the nutrition's down to, but if they can't hold up their own and their own end of the bargain, there's only so much you can do. And I remember Andrew, when we spoke to him last week, spoke about if you only see them two or three hours in a week, that's a lot of hours in a week. You don't have control or direct influence over. So it has this, you have to realize that when we stay in our scope of practice, right? We're not physical therapists, even though we do a very, very similar job. We can't manipulate tissue as such. Um, I was just kind of go for a tangent shocker. But I, I, I do <laughs> like that point you made. I think it's it's soup when your client is excited and when they hit those numbers of this PR. It's you, you. Uh, I remember, this is one of the reasons that reminds me why I love doing what I do, why I love working with people. And, you know, there's nothing better than when someone says, thank you so much. Like when someone says that you've changed their life, that's one of the best things I think as a movement coach that you can hear. I think, you know, if someone like you mentioned their posture or a lot of people, I know there are definitely some instances where some clients either end up walking with us less frequently or by themselves. But if you've taught them, like I know for both of you, for example, and I've seen some of your clients walk up by themselves, whether it was an off day or something, they carry out the program, the style of training that you've taught them. You've done your job well, because Damn right. <laughs> like, again, I can, I can name right off the bat, both of one of your clients, for example, that when they're working up by themselves, we're doing similar patterns to what you would have taught them, how you taught them, right form, everything. And I know it's like, oh, that what guy worked with Angel, that guy worked with David, and he's lifting, he's still lifting a squatting press in the way he would have taught him. And that I think is a at the end of the day, if you can do that, that speaks volumes over your former training. That's just something else I want to throw in. Yeah, I wish there was a way to make it so that you can do more with the people that you have like those brief interactions with, right? Like all mm. those um people who just like they start and then they quit or they start they do the complimentary sessions and then they drop out like i wish there was a a easier way to Mm. help those people long term because unfortunately like it does cost something right and you know that's that's the way it is Mm. but um if there was a way to reach out to those people and keep them engaged and help teach them over time because the other options the other free options are pretty much shit like those are those uh, things that you were talking about those pinterest people are like do these exercises and then you'll be ripped but i saw um, an app that said click on how much you weigh uh and it'll tell you or click on how much you weigh what your age is and your height and it'll give you a number of miles you need to run every day to lose weight yeah damn you didn't like, even know that you needed you to lose squat? weight <laughs> it was right. like, i didn't like, even oh, know you want to lose weight Look, plug in your numbers and get how many and like that doesn't mean shit you know they could be running look the, at the numbers the like miles. 18 you're like a day <laughs> 18 miles a day you can fuck yourself up man you ain't gonna do that again but yeah. angel did you want to finish off i didn't want to cut you off you guys no nah, that was it that was pretty much it we, we can wrap it up we'll after. wrap it up one last thing i had and i also had a client talk about the bmi it's like oh my bmi is this and i said don't worry about the bmi because this is a perfect example. I can't remember who told me this and I saw this. Arnold Schwarzenegger's BMI is the same now as when he was competing. He doesn't look the same. He is nowhere near as in shape as he was when he was competing, but his BMI is the same. Don't take into consideration, especially if you're listening, oh, my BMI is high or whatever. BMI does not take into account what percentage of your body is water muscle bone fat doesn't take that into consideration it's just a quick fire off of oh weight and high and eight boom so don't i, I don't know why on the end body it's still there when you look at these numbers because to me i i explain this to clients like this number pff, don't bother with it don't look at it doesn't my client who's a surgeon is like that number's stupid i need a psycholo- yeah we need to team up with a psychological therapist to um dissect some of these things because i think that some of those things are there because they want people to feel bad about it so that way they know that there's something that they need to work on 
and it's difficult for a I'm just gonna say it. It's difficult for well, no, I'm not gonna say it. It's difficult say for it. an uneducated hey. trainer to mess up, right? If something, a piece of paper, they get you on it, and the piece of paper says you're obese, the the uneducated trainer can say, "Oh yeah, this is off, and that's off, and this is this, and this is that, and this is that," and that person's gonna walk away with, "I am obese, and I need this personal trainer or I need this coach," right? And then they hire the personal trainer they do what they got to do but um they're not they're going at it from a angle of their obese or significantly obese or whatever it says um and that's not necessarily that might not be what they need to change in their form of fat shaming you know it's essentially that because like you're not going to change anything with a personal trainer in regards to your body composition you'll change your movement habits you'll change you know maybe you'll guide them through your other habits but that has to do with a different department. At least that's how it works in my brain, right? Like you go to nutritionists, you see like the registered dietitians um, in order to tackle that. You know, if you got injuries, you go to physical therapy, like you see the physios, uh, your chiros. And then when you want to work on your movements, you go to your coaches. Um, but, you know, everybody wants to do things the way they want to do it. So that's why. Don't let you cry, crack, don't let you cry, crack, crack your neck though. Oh yeah, definitely not for free either. Who does that? This guy. The neck of all places. Anyway. <laughs> hey, yo. hey yo. Anyway, uh we'll wrap it up here. We'll call it. Um thanks guys for listening. Stay tuned and we'll check you out next time. Bye guys. Take it easy. <laughs>